Are you in a marriage that's absolutely fantastic? If so, one of the rare ones. Most of us in our marriages have marriages that are good to okay. But how can we make them better? How can we make them stronger? Are there some underlying principles we can learn there, particularly so that we would never wind up in a divorce? Well, let's talk about that in a few minutes. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Beam with Marriage Helper, and this is Kimberly Holmes, our CEO, uh, the great leader we have that helps us help a whole lot of people all around the world. So Kimberly, in just a minute or two, let's talk about that. How to make a marriage different, how to avoid divorce. This is Relationship Radio, an extension of Marriage Helper International, hosted by renowned marriage and relationship expert, Dr. Joe Beam, and CEO of Marriage Helper, Kimberly Beam Holmes. We answer your questions directly with research-based principles that you can implement immediately. Regardless of the situation, what we teach will not only make your relationships better, but will also help you to become the best version of yourself along the way. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to turn on notifications. Turn up the volume and prepare to take notes as we begin this week's episode of Relationship Radio. Just a couple of months ago, we, Marriage Helper, actually partnered with Barna Research Group, a very well-known large research group, to do some studies on what is the state of marriage here in 2021? That's the year we're in right now, the year we did this study. And what our research found from these survey takers was that at least 33% of married people are currently wanting to seek help for their relationship. That's at least one out of three couples. And I keep saying at least because there's some confirmation bias here. I think there's probably people who took the survey that may have not admitted that they were wanting to get marriage help as can happen. And so we know it's at least. But when we partner that with Gottman's research, where he has seen that couples wait a, an average of six years after problems begin to occur in their marriage before they actually get help, we can start to see this storm brewing for marriages that are going to end up being in crisis or maybe even ultimately headed towards divorce because they're wanting to seek help. They're not seeking help. They know there's problems. They're not fixing them. And nothing is just going to get better with time. It's only going to get worse unless you do something about it. Well, if that uh, one third figure plays true throughout America, uh, for example, there are roughly 60 million married couples in the United States of America, not counting the rest of the world, obviously. And if one third of those need or think they need help, then that's basically 20 million couples. Therefore, if your marriage is not absolutely perfect, <laughs> don't feel that you're alone. And even that's not measuring uh, the marriages where they think everything is just wonderful. They're not actually that many. Most of us realize that in real life that, you know, there are ups and downs and in-betweens, but there are some basic principles. Now, we could talk about a lot of them, but because of the length of this program, we're going to concentrate basically on one, which has to do with what people typically say is the biggest problem they have in their marriage, and that is communication. We hear that all the time. Now, we're not sure that that's exactly the biggest problem, but we'll tie it to what we understand is a major problem. Put two things together. One of the big things that causes a person to want to be out of a relationship is when they feel disrespected. You do not respect me. And communication is typically the way you communicate either that you do respect or disrespect. And we're not talking about in the sense that you say, well, I respect you. We're talking about how you demonstrate it in the words that you use, the tone of voice in which you use them, the volume <laughs> in which you use them, and many other things like that. So, Kimberly, when it comes to communication, if it's going to happen, it has to be two-way. The idea that forms in my head, I'm going to code into some kind of words and actions, like my hand gestures, my facial expression. And so I encode it, and then I send it to you. Well, then you have to decode it, which means you're not only listening to my words, you're looking at my eyes, you're looking at my facial expression, you're noticing what kind of hand gestures I use, which is why we communicate so much more effectively in person than we do over the telephone and especially by text where most of that's just not there. And then you have to, as you uncode it, hopefully what's going to wind up in your head is the same message that started in my head or at least close. 
<laughs> now, I could say something that I think is extremely respectful that lets you know how much I love you. But if I choose the wrong coding or if you uncode it incorrectly, then you might think that I just insulted you. And so it's a wonder in some sense that we ever communicate at all. It really is. I was just thinking about a couple of nights ago, my husband and I were out to dinner with with someone and I was telling this story about something that happened on our first date. And Rob spoke up and he said, I don't remember that happening. And when we got in the car, I said to him, Rob, do you realize that when you said that, it made me feel like you were saying I was lying about it. And he said, oh my goodness, that's not what I meant at all. I meant how crazy is it that you remember something so important that has lasted this long and it's just something I completely forgot, but it was that important to you. And I thought, wow, like what a loss in translation, right? Like that to me, I interpreted it one way. He meant it a different way. Had we not had the conversation about it, it could have led to long lasting resentment. Oh, he was disrespectful. He just thinks I'm a liar. He doesn't think of how he comes across. But once I understood his point of view, I still wish it would have happened a little bit differently, but at least I can see where he's coming from. It helped make the co- the conversation and communication better in the future because we talked about it. And and think about it in world history. When America dropped the uh, atomic bombs, two of well, the first one after the first one in Hiroshima and Japan, we demanded immediate surrender. And they answered with a Japanese word that our interpreters understand to meant we're ignoring you. Actually, it's a word that means we're thinking it over. And because we heard that first answer, we dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. Now, it's more complicated than what I just said, but but sometimes that happens with couples without a doubt. Even the word you use, the other person hears it completely differently. Oh, and then add to it other people chipping in or chiming in. You can imagine now, oh, let me tell you what I heard so-and-so say about you the other day. And if you believe that they're being accurate when they say what the other person allegedly said the other day, they can drive a wedge between the two of you when the person didn't say anything at all. And so communication can communicate love, respect, and like. I like you. And those are the three primary reasons people want out of a relationship. I don't feel that you like me. I don't feel that you love me. I don't feel that you respect me. And so if you're going to work on anything, and again, we can't cover everything in one short session like this, but if you're going to work on anything, work on communication that will communicate that you can code in such a way that the other person will most likely hear that you do communicate respectfully, that you do love them, that you do like them. And then it'll go a whole lot better if you can do that. But what happens when it doesn't? Because often it doesn't. So we have a couple of questions that people have sent in about this, Kimberly. Let's uh, let's pause and hear this question, and then we'll uh, come back and give an answer to what they're asking about and the principles that we're talking about here. Hi, guys. My name is Amanda. I'm an admin for the Facebook groups for Marriage Helper, and Dr. Beam and Kimberly have asked me to read a question that was submitted by one of our listeners for today's episode. The following question was submitted by Elizabeth. Your videos changed my life. I am currently in the beginning of a whole new relationship with my husband after almost two years of separation. How do I make this relationship ironclad and bulletproof? And at what point should we start talking about our expectations of one another? I would imagine that every relationship has some of this. That just as you said, what Rob said the other night, he didn't mean to hurt you, but it was hurtful whether he meant it to be or not. And so here's a person, this was a lady, by the way, who asked that, and she said about her husband, that he's had said some things in the past that are very hurtful. How can I feel good about him again? How can I feel good about this relationship? How do I get that, as she calls it, loving feeling back when those things are still in my head? So let me give you one idea, and then Kimberly, let's talk more about it. Not everything needs to be discussed. Now, before you get angry, listen to me. What I mean is that sometimes you can make the proverbial molehill into the mountain by bringing it up and and the other person doesn't understand why it's such a big deal to you and you start arguing about it and it gets bigger and bigger. And so the next thing you know, it's into a major argument, major discord, when it's something that in actuality wasn't that big a deal to begin with for you. Now, if it's big enough that you need to talk about it, you need to talk about it. 
So don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that you sweep everything under the rug. But sometimes I think you have to ask yourself the question, is this really bothering me enough that we really should have an intense conversation about this? Because, you know, the dreadful words that husbands <laughs> hate to hear, fear to hear are, we need to talk. <laughs> like, oh, good grief. What's going to happen? What did I do now? And so my first suggestion is this. Hey, ask yourself, do I really think that he or she, whoever your spouse is, is, is a person who meant to hurt me when he or she said that? Or do I think they probably just didn't get it? Well, if they didn't get it, and I think that's probably the case, then what's the advantage of bringing it up now? I've been hurt in the past. Now, if it's happening at the moment and they don't get it, it's a place for communication. Let me tell you how that felt. But if it happened in the past and you're going to bring it up from last week, last month, last year, last decade, then the other person's probably going to be thinking, good grief, how long have you been harboring that? And well, what do you really feel about me? And so my first suggestion is, if you can get over it, get over it. Don't necessarily bring it up. But obviously that can't be done with everything. There are things that really matter. So what's another suggestion we can give them here, Kimberly? To that point, I, I would venture to say many of the things that we get really hurt about that our spouses might say to us, we could go further back on the timeline in our lives and realize that that is something that is significant to us because maybe someone said something to us like that when we were a kid or something happened when we were, you know, growing up that our parents did or that we were bullied or whatever. I a lot of it goes back to what we've endured before and we're hearing that message again. And so we can react stronger to that because there's so much more emotion behind it than, than some other people would for the same, if their husband or wife had said the exact same thing to them. And so to your point, instead of focusing on, it's because my spouse said this and they're in the wrong, which they very well could and may be, ask yourself, is this coming from someplace deeper from something that really I need to work on within myself first and foremost. And maybe you do have the conversation, but instead, but instead you can have it in saying, you know what, you probably don't know this about me. Maybe I haven't shared this with you, but something like this happened when I was a kid, when I was younger, and it led me to feel very vulnerable. And so when you said that unknowingly, this is the emotion that it caused within me. Would you mind doing it a different way in the future. I think that's wonderful, but I suggest that that be done in the present rather than bringing up something that was said or done last week, last month, last year. But I think you're absolutely right. And, and then you can teach your spouse, not that he or she is less educated than you or ignorant. I'm not meaning that, but you can teach your spouse how to communicate and you communicate with them by learning, by, by modeling a good way, which is do your best to listen to more than just their words. Try to understand the meaning of what they're saying and try to understand the emotion that's behind it. Now, uh, we had to close our offices because of COVID and now all of our folks work out of their homes. Plus you keep adding more and more staff. So now we have people literally all over, not just America, but the world working with us and couldn't come to the office because they would have to uh, come back, you know, from South Africa every day and things like that. But back when we had an office, sometimes I'd come home in a grouchy mood because of the fact that I had dealt with somebody in pain and I took on some of that pain myself, which is not healthy, not the best thing to do when you're a helper and come home and walk in the door and snap at Alice. And so what she learned to do was not just listen to the words, but to, to try to understand the meaning. And so typically she wouldn't react immediately. Like, don't you talk to me like that? Typically, she'd wait a little while and start asking you about me about the day. You know, what happened? Did I talk to anybody today? Anybody call? <laughs> Any events? And, and eventually, she would understand why I snapped at her and that it had nothing to do with her at all. And that the emotion behind it was my frustration of trying to help somebody that I couldn't figure out how to help because I, well, basically, typically because they want to do what they want to do, even if it's the wrong thing. And so if you can try to understand the emotions and the meaning by him, what they say. Uh, Dave Ramsey once gave me a book, Kimberly, I think you've read it. It was, uh, name of the book was QBQ, question behind the question. It's like, if you hear this question or you hear that statement, it's really good to try to think 
okay, what's behind that? What's going on? Now, if you model that for your spouse, then they'll actually start doing the same thing with you. Now, you may have to do a little teaching after you've modeled it for a while. Well, would you like to know why I feel that way, which is exactly what you were talking about just a couple of moments ago, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So if I'm trying to understand the meaning and emotions of what my spouse just said, how will I know if I'm right or not about my interpretation? I think the only thing you can do is ask them. In what way? How does that make you feel? That's the, I mean, that is the first way that comes to my mind. What are the emotions that come up when, when that happened or when I said that, or when you're telling me about this thing that happened, what are the stories that you're telling yourself about it that are coming to mind? And you're, asking them. I think the worst thing that we can do is listen to our spouse tell us something and we attribute the feelings we feel from how maybe we would react in that moment and say, well, they must feel the exact same way I would feel if I was in that instead of really trying to understand their felt, their felt emotions during that event that they're describing. Yeah. When you're working on your master's degree in marriage and family therapy, I'm sure they thought about this thing called active listening, where that you feed back what you just heard to see if it's correct. Mm, mm-hmm. Now, sometimes you can do it like that. Am I understanding that you're upset because of that call today? That's a direct way to do it. Or sometimes you can even be a little bit bolder about that. Like, oh, I can see why that really would frustrate you. So feeding back to the other person. And I think what you just said is really, really good. How do we not ascribe to the other person the emotions that we have. I mean, because that's kind of a typical thing to do, right? That if you do a say a certain thing, say a certain thing, I tend to think that you feel or uh, what I would be feeling. How, how can I learn to get past that and really hear you? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I believe it goes back to when you are focusing so much on the other person. Let, Let me back up and say it this way. So, when I was doing my interview with Dr. Gottman a couple of weeks ago, which will be on the It Starts With Attraction podcast, you can go and listen to it there. But I That's asked cool. you know who John Gottman is. He's like the guru when it comes to marriage research, right? Yeah. He's been doing it 50 years. 50 years. I was amazed when you got him for an interview. And and so, yeah, uh, how do they find that podcast if they want to listen to you interview Dr. Gottman? Yes, it's an amazing episode. It will be on the It Starts With Attraction podcast. So you can go find It Starts With Attraction right after you listen to this episode and go and find the episode with Dr. John Gottman. It's a fantastic episode. One of the things I, I asked him and really kept harping on was, so you have studied all these thousands of marriages and what makes them last and what leads to divorce. What is some of the best things that you can say this will lead to a long lasting, happy marriage? And one of the things he said was, we need to continue to stay curious about our spouse. So when you have the conversations with them and you're listening to what they're saying, instead of listening just to respond, listen to ask more questions, listen to want to just continue knowing more and more about them. And so that's this picture I have in my mind of if Rob is sitting in front of me, telling me this story of how he feels, or maybe how something I said upset him, then, then I want to ask more questions. Well, tell me more about that. How did that make you feel? And just make them be the center of the stage, not you, but them. And that can mentally help you to remember, it's not about me right now. It's about them. And for me to listen to what they're telling me and say curious about wanting to understand my spouse even better. Yes, I I see that. But that's kind of difficult for the person, this woman who asked this question. I'm still hurt from things he said a while back. So how does she uh, not make it about her? Because she's wanting to communicate what she feels. I think we can answer that as part of the next question we have. So can we just go to the next question? And then we're going to answer that for her while answering something for the next person as well. Hi, my name is Priscilla and I work on the coaching team here at Marriage Helper. I coach couples and individuals through their marriage crisis. The following question was submitted to us by one of our listeners. Jennifer submitted this question. How do I get that loving feeling back when I'm bothered by things that my husband has said that are hurtful? Now, it sounds like this person is coming from a totally different direction than the first question we looked at, but yet there's still similarities in the answers. 
If you want to make it ironclad, uh, I think the point you just made that Dr. Gottman made is outstanding. Remain curious about the other person. Ask questions. What do you think about this? How do you feel about that? What would you like? What would you not like? Things like that. I think continually learning makes a lot of sense. Gottman has shown that's very valid. So if I want to make this bulletproof, as this lady says, I don't know if you can make anything 100% bulletproof, but if you want to make it safe. And at the same time, but, but I need to talk about what I feel then uh, we teach people, not just us, everybody in the marriage business who knows what they're doing teaches this part. And that is that when you want to talk about what your spouse's words or actions have done or are doing to you, don't make it an accusation. Take it an honest representation of what you feel. And so if I say, you make me so mad, the other person is likely to become defensive. Now, if they're very mature, they might say something like, wow, how am I doing that? But we can't always count on anybody, including ourselves, being mature. And so rather than saying, you did this, you did that, you did this, take the word you out and speak from the uh, framework of I. May I tell you how I feel when that kind of thing happens? May I tell you how I feel when I hear those words? So try to take the word you as much as possible out of the conversation and put the word I. Kimberly, why does that tend to help people be less defensive when they hear that? Right. Because when you say it with the you statement, then automatically they're, they're realizing this is an attack on me. This is something I have done. Whereas when it's positioned as I feel this way when this happens, then it's less about what that person intentionally did, because that's how it can come across. And more so of, oh, this is how you feel when this happens or this, you know, me saying it, this is how I feel. They can hear it. As, as less defensive, because then it's more of a problem to solve together. Another great way that I, that I heard it talked about is that instead of going to someone and saying, I need to talk to you about something, you can say, because there you have a couple of things, need to talk to you about something. It's like, that's bad. But when you approach someone and say, hey, I want to work this out with you. I want us to work through something together. Then you're looking at it as more of this team effort. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking in ways that you can change your language to be more collaborative and less accusatory and divisive, because that's what will lead to the fights. And sometimes even asking permission for the conversation, not like you're a slave or a child. I don't mean that, but, but say to the other person, wow, there's something I'd really like to talk about. Well, would that be okay? That way they become a more of a willing or at least more willing than they would have otherwise participant saying, okay, what, what can we talk about? What is it? Let's talk about it. And so this lady, first of all, uh, I was remiss not thanking her. Thank you for saying that our videos have changed your life. That, that is what we live for. That's what we exist for. That's what this whole organization is about is to help people find within themselves peace and joy and, and fantastic relationships although there will never be perfect relationships. And so thank you for that comment about that. We appreciate that. And we hope you guys are checking out all of our videos on youtube.com slash marriage helper. One long word, marriage helper there. And so Kimberly, if a couple is really communicating that way, okay, uh, I'm not attacking you. Uh, and things that are minor, I'm just going to swallow and go past it. Like that's just not worth the kind of fight that we might get into it for it. But sometimes it's like, you know, this is something we really need to talk about. We really need to do this right now, that kind of stuff. When they do that, how does that help bulletproof a marriage? We haven't talked about sex. We haven't talked about money. We haven't talked about children. I mean, there are many, many, many aspects of marriage. But how can this one affect all of that in positive ways? You're learning how to work together as a team. And that's it. It's building this, this cadence, this foundation of the way you communicate from the get-go. And I understand this isn't the, the first get-go for them. They were separated and they're getting back together. But this is such a great opportunity to build that great foundation of how you communicate. Because once you establish, we are a team, we're partners, we're going to work through things together, let's collaborate. Then you can better handle when disagreements come about parenting, kids, finances, because you have set a respectful and collaborative way to discuss things and work through things. The other thing she mentions here is 
expectations. Having a great communication foundation also helps you to better talk about expectations. One of the things that Rob and I recently started doing after hearing after hearing a sermon at church on Sunday that was all about expectations and about how we have unspoken expectations. We have unagreed upon expectations and and all these different things. And so we've just started saying our expectations. Even when we enter into a conversation, if I'm just wanting to vent about something that happened during the day unrelated to Rob, then I can start that conversation by saying, Hey, I'm just wanting to vent. I don't need help fixing anything. I don't need any of that. But the expectation of this conversation right now is please just listen to me and tell me how much it sucks to be in my shoes right now. (laughs) That's all I want to (laughs) hear. And so when we should just start saying our expectations. Now, there's this other part of it, which is, are your expectations realistic? And we have to make sure that's true. But really, communication can get very fundamental. Work together together. Say clearly what you are wanting or needing from that interaction or from the conversation, and then work together to find a shared compromising end result. And there you go. That's kind of sums it all up. Then if I can listen to the meaning of what you're saying, not just the words, but try to understand the emotion and you do the same for me. And we can talk about anything openly and honestly. We won't always immediately agree, but typically, at least with some time and discussion, we can find a compromise that we're both okay with. This will work out. And and we actually teach a lot about that that we can't explain in great detail right here because of the fact we're just about out of time. But if you understand this, then it will help you solve problems with money or in-laws or sex or how to do with your children or anything else. But remember, it's all about the other person wants to feel loved, wants to feel respected, and wants to feel liked. When we feel those three things, we want to stay in a relationship. If we feel that any of those three is lacking, our commitment to the relationship begins to change. And so hopefully the information we've given, that's not a be all, end all that that solves everything. But if you guys have listened to this, hopefully we'll help you with these things. So Kimberly, what are the key takeaways and what resource can we offer to help? Absolutely. We definitely have resources to help. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. The first key takeaway is to decide what you can get past on your own. As we talked about, there are things that maybe we don't actually need to bring up or bring up again with our spouse. We can decide that it's not the hill we want to die on. It's not a battle worth fighting. It's really something that we can forgive and move on from. We don't have to bring up every tiny problem that we encounter in our relationships because that's not helpful. So decide what you can get past on your own. And then secondly, learn how to listen more than to just listening to the words understand the meaning of what's going on, understand what's going on behind the conversation, tune into stories from the past, feelings from the past, or even current body language to really get the full picture of what is actually happening. And then third, communicate your understanding until your spouse confirms it. So this goes back to what we were saying of Ask for feedback when, and you do this first by modeling it. Maybe when your spouse says something to you, you say, let me repeat back what I heard you say to make sure that I understood it correctly. And then over time, allow that to be something both of you bring into your daily conversation, especially when you're having hard conversations. So you both leave on the same page. That's crucial. And then learn how to communicate from the I position rather than from the you position. I feel this way when this happens, instead of when you do this, you make me feel. You can just already hear the difference in the approach for both of those. And then finally, when you need help, get it. There are still going to be difficult conversations that maybe you gridlock on and you're having trouble working past. There is no shame in needing to get professional help, whether that be through a coach, like one of our marriage helper coaches. Or if you have a really great counselor or know of a really great marriage counselor in your area that is pro-marriage, that can be a great resource. My favorite resource that we offer and for this situation we've been talking about is our Marriage Helper Turnaround Weekend. And it is my favorite because it has amazing success. It has fantastic results. The people who go through it 
just have a life change transformation happen. And it happens almost every single weekend. We have so many workshops going on. That's the best resource that we offer. And you will definitely learn a lot about how to communicate better and set your marriage up to be as ironclad as humanly possible with the resources that we teach there. And how would they find out more about those resources you just mentioned? By the way, some weekends we have more than one of those workshops going on because there are so many people that come into them. So how do they find out what's the easiest and best way for them before we talk about what the next Relationship Radio episode will be about? Just before I tell them, how can they find out about this information? You know, the best way to get started and understanding what we can help you with at Marriage Helper, including with our Marriage Helper workshop for sure, is scheduling a free call with one of our client relations representatives. We call it a free marriage strategy call. Basically what that means is you set a time, you speak with one of our people, you tell them a bit about your situation, and they will tell you more about our workshop and how the workshop will help you in your situation. But if the workshop isn't the best option for you just yet or right now, they can still point you to how some of our other resources can help, such as some of our online courses or even our absolutely fantastic marriage coaching program that we have as well. So you can schedule that call. You can go to the show notes. You can click the link there to schedule that call with one of our CRs, our client reps. Or if if you're watching this on YouTube, you can click the link on the screen or the link in the show description. Well, as uh, you were quoting the statistics to begin with, that one out of three American marriages, at least, are saying that they need help or they feel like they should get help. And and Dr. Gottman's response about people going as long as six years before they get it, understand that if you want to make your marriage different, then practice the kind of things we're talking about here. It can change your relationship. And the reason it'll make your marriage different is because of the fact that most people aren't doing this. They're not spending any time with each other, not having real conversations at all. As a matter of fact, barely even see each other and they drift further and further apart. Well, if you do the kind of things we talked about, even just in this program, that'll make your marriage different than most other marriages, not just in America, but in the world, because we deal with couples from all over the world. As a matter of fact, we've had uh, clients from every continent except Antarctica. None from there yet, but every other continent. Well, in our next episode, let's move on to another word and let's talk about infidelity. You might be thinking, well, okay, I hear what you're saying, but can we have that kind of communication if one of us has had an affair, if if infidelity has occurred? Well, that's something we need to talk about. Can you save a marriage after infidelity? And then when do you walk away? Because sometimes Sometimes you'll make that decision after infidelity that it's time to walk away from this marriage. Well, in the next two relationship radios, we'll talk about those topics. I'm Dr. Joe Beam, and that's Kimberly Holmes, our CEO, and we look forward to seeing you soon on another relationship radio. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Relationship Radio. Please refer to the notes in the description to learn more about any resources mentioned in this episode. Please visit our website at marriagehelper.com for more information about our online courses, marriage workshops, and coaching. If you would like immediate help for your marriage situation, then click on the link on the screen to schedule a free marriage strategy call with one of our team members. We exist to help save marriages and strengthen families. We look forward to interacting with you on the next episode of Relationship Radio.